Welcome to another episode of Eric Way Whiskey Studies, and in this video, going to do a review of the Ben Nevis Traditional Peated Malt Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Uh, I visited Ben Nevis Distillery on my fourth trip to Scotland. In my first three trips, I had been all over the Lowlands, Campbelltown, Erin, Isla Twice, Speyside Highlands, and all the way up to Orkney. Where I hadn't been to was the Western Highlands and over to the Northern Hebrides. So my fourth trip, I went to the Northwestern Hebridean Islands, and on the way there, I stopped at Ben Nevis Distillery. Not the most impressive distillery in terms of a tour. It's a little bit antiquated, a little bit run down. It needs some investment from its owners. Really nice people, don't get me wrong, uh, but the distillery itself was a little bit, uh, you know, Looking around, you don't see a whole lot of Ben Nevis on your shelves. You don't see it in the liquor stores. You don't see a whole lot online. Most of what you're going to see is a 10-year-old and a lot of independent bottles. So, I'm going to give you a review of this whiskey. It is a core range, so if you search around for it, you can find it. But before I get into this, I'm going to share with you my little tour of Ben Nevis Distillery. Talk a little bit about their core range and then review this whiskey. Ben Nevis Distillery is located in Fort William, Scotland, at the base of Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in the British Isles. The distillery was founded in 1825 by Long John MacDonald. Ben Nevis is currently owned by Nika. They have a 10-ton louder mash ton. They use wood washbacks. They have a 48 hour fermentation. They have four onion shaped stills. That is two wash stills and two spirit stills. The Ben Nevis Core Range. The Ben Nevis 10 year old single malt scotch whiskey is lightly peated. I could not find any information on what casts are used. I would guess probably ex bourbon cast. It's bottled at 46% alcohol by volume. The Ben Nevis traditional peated malt single malt scotch whiskey, aged in refill American and European oak barrels and butts. It is lightly peated, it is non-chill filtered, has natural color, and is bottled at 46% alcohol by volume. So as you saw there in the notes, they are currently owned by Nika, a Japanese uh, company. If you ever had Nika from the barrel, which I think is an excellent whiskey, it even made like whiskey advocates, like I think it was like within the top 10 one year, maybe even number one one year. Highly rated by the, in the Oz was. It's a really good whiskey. It has a lot of artisanry to it in its blending and uh, marriage of casks. The shocker is, is that it probably isn't really a Japanese whiskey, but it's Scottish whiskey from Ben Nevis that maybe could be blended with Japanese whiskey, but it's actually got Scottish whiskey in it. Japanese whiskey industry is still getting their act together. They have some guidelines that are being sort of followed by some in the industry, but uh, they're not legally enforceable. It's not like the, like the Scotch Whiskey Association. But it does show the artisanry of Japanese blenders and the finesse that it can, they can give it. Um, and it is a really nice whiskey. I really like it. But what happens is when you think, ah, Japanese whiskey, and you find out, no, it's Scotch, then there's a certain lack of uh, integrity there, which I think has had a major impact on Japanese whiskey. In the meantime, there's been a lot of discussion about regionality. Is, is Scottish regionality still a thing? Is it, a, is it accurate? Is it still useful? So on and so forth. I think the problem is, think, people think of regionality 
and something reflecting a region. And they try to equate it with terroir, a French notion of terroir. And the problem is, let's take a Pinot Noir grape. Pinot Noir grape, a Burgundian varietal, it has a distinctive characteristics within the uh, Cote Nui, within Burgundy, Bourgogne. Plant that same grape in, say, the Russian River of California, it takes on a different character. Plant it in the Las Canales region of the southern part of Napa, a different character. Take it down to uh, Santa Barbara along the coast, a different character. Go all the way up to Oregon in the Lama Valley, and it has a different character. Why? because Pinot Noir is very reflective of its climate, soils, and so forth. Now, if you have that mentality and you try to approach whiskey with it, particularly Scotch whiskey, you're going to find yourself disappointed and it doesn't really work. You're going to have to sort of fake it. It is true that a new make spirit made from different barleys grown on different soils will have a different characteristic. However, once you do your fermentation, depending on the yeast you use, whether a long fermentation or short fermentation will radically affect the spirit. And then shape is still, length of the still, the rate at which you're distilling, whether you do direct firing, or whether you use a steam coil, uh, the shape and size and the angle of the line arm, how you're doing your cuts in the spirit safe. And then the casks, you spend years in a cask and the cask can take up 65% of the character Okay, how much of that new egg spirit is still there if you got some real maturation to it? Long story short, I think trying to really approach Scotch whiskey and sense of terroir in that sense, uh, I think you're chasing after the wind. Instead, what you need to think of Scotch whiskey is not like grapes, not like wine, but it's more like pizza. And you're like, what? Pizza? Yeah. You have New York style pizza. You have a Chicago style pizza. You have a California pizza. And they're different. There are There is a tradition to New York pizza. There is a tradition to Chicago pizza. There is a sort of a hippie, new age, <laughs> avant-garde style to California, distinctively California pizza. And you can see the same thing with barbecue. You got your Texas barbecue, you got your Kansas City barbecue. Different places in the United States do barbecue differently. You know, Louisiana barbecue, right? If you see or think of Scotch whiskey as being reflective of a place, not in terms of soil and the wind and, and, and all that, but in ten, instead in terms of culture and tradition, then the terroir, if you want to still use that term, of a Scotch whiskey is a reflective of its place due to its tradition. Not the soil, the climate, uh, the, the vintage variations in the weather and all that. Although, yes, those are applicable, you know, whether you're using, you know, peat or not peat. Peat is reflective, you know, what's the composition of the peat? Is it highland peat? Is it isla peat? Yes, that can make a difference. If you're using Orkney peat, you know, yes, that can make a difference. So yes, there is a certain amount of terroir that can be in whiskey, but not as much as people think, and not in terms of what has traditionally been associated with Scotch whiskey regions. Now, why am I saying all this? Why am I saying all this? Because... This whiskey reflects what I think is a tradition, traditional malt, peated malt, of the Western Highlands and the Hebrides, and the, and the Hebrides. And so I was really, really, really excited to finally visit this region and visit Benevis, Ardnamurkin, uh, Rasse, Torveig, and so forth. Uh, Talisker, probably the most well-known out there, because there are some similarities in a general sense that is a reflection of where they're at geographically, not in terms of necessarily climate, soils, and all that. So just as the Kildalton Trio in the southern part of Isla has a distinctive character that they reflect 
a, a place, it's more of, yes, Isla Pete has a distinctive character, but it's more a case of tradition. New York style pizza versus Chicago pizza versus California pizza or Kansas City barbecue versus Texas barbecue that might get near Austin, Texas. So really excited to head out there to the Western Islands, uh, the Western side of Scotland and uh, visit the distillery. So there's a distinctive character, this Pete, that I think is somewhat reflective of that part of Scotland. Peated Scots from Campbelltown, obviously Springbank is different than Orkney, Highland Park, different than Ardbeg, Laphroaig, Lagavulin, Bamore, or even Kalila or Cahoan from Isla. And so also, uh, Western Scotland, peat is different. If by tradition alone, not by necessarily where it's located. So it's a moderate peat. It's not as intense as the Kildalton Trio. Um, do you get that salty sea breeze there? Eh, potentially, maybe a little bit. But Ben ne Nevis isn't hugging the ocean the way Talisker is. And a lot of Talisker is actually aged in a warehouse and not on site. So how can it be getting oceanic? I know I'm getting off track here. The oceanic influence if they're you know, aging it on the, on, the, on the mainland. I don't know. So it has a moderate intensity of peat. If you don't like heavily peated whiskeys, you might want to start with this one. If you're a peat monster, uh, then you might find this rather tame. But I'm going to say it's moderate. It's a 90 statement. It does seem rather youthful. I'm getting this weird juicy fruit chewing gum, you know, Wrigley's chewing gum character to it which makes me think that's youth. Usually from a young whiskey, you get some of that new Mickey character. You tend to get some like weird melon, a limey character. This actually gets into a little bit of stone fruit. There's a interesting herbal black licorice character. Very faint, it's not big, it's not in your nose, not sort of in your face, but it's faint. That is one of the variations of Pete. Pete can give you pepper. Pete can give you meat character, which is typically what I really like. Uh, he can give you that barbecue character. Uh, Pete can give you ash. Pete can give you campfire. Pete can give you medicinal notes. There's a little, huge range of character you can get from a Pete. Not only in terms of what is the composition of the Pete, but how they did their cuts at the Spirit Safe. And so I'm getting that slight herbal character, a little bit of black licorice. The fruit, beyond the juicy fruit gum, a slight tropical note, maybe a little bit of pear. It's moderate intensity on the palate. Slight, youthful nip, a youth of spirit. It is silky on the mid palate. Moderate amount of change from front to the middle into the finish. Somewhat sweet up front. Goes a little bit more herbal and savory in the mid palate. And what lingers is a melon character, somewhat tropical character, uh, and uh, the, the peat smoke. So, it's not a dramatic whiskey that is going to wow you. It's just sort of in the, in, in the mid range, on middle. It's an all right whiskey. I wish it had a little bit more oomph. I wish it had a little bit more variation. I wish it had a little bit more going on to the finish. It's just mostly, I would say, just a nice, all right whiskey. What would I give in terms of score? I'm gonna go solid 87 points, solid 87 points. Length of finish is about moderate. So everything is moderate about this whiskey. I like that it's got sweetness and a little bit of that herbal character on, on, on the finish. So it's an all right whiskey. Um, if you are in the region and you're heading west, you're gonna head out to the islands, I would highly recommend checking out Ben Nevis, do a quick uh, tour of the distillery. The distillery needs some work. As you saw there in the video, it's looking a little aged. The people there were super nice, a really nice tour, uh, real friendly and all that. 
but the distillery itself could use some investment from its owners. All right, uh, that's it for this uh, video and this review. If you've subscribed to this channel, well, thank you very much. If you've not yet subscribed, but you like watching my videos, I would greatly appreciate it. If you would subscribe, ring the bell to be notified for when I go live or post a new video. And until next time, slanja. Hey, don't forget to subscribe and check out these other whiskey videos.